And we're going to continue now our live coverage of the Mackinac Policy Conference and take you in for the last session of the day. Our colleague Stephen Henderson is actually moderating this one. It's called Closing the Opportunity Gap for Michigan's Children. Who talks about these things on radio and television. But it's also become something that I'm much more personally interested in. Uh, and I'll tell a quick story about, about why. I've recently become really involved in the neighborhood where I was born in Detroit, uh, near L Livernois and Grand River, near St. Cecilia. If you're a basketball fan of any kind, you know about St. Cecilia's gym where uh, lots of NBA greats played as kids and, and still come really to play. When I was born there in 1970, you know, it was a working class neighborhood. Most people either worked in auto plants or for OEMs. Uh, they had, you know, two, two job households were becoming pretty common. People were trying to, to hold it together. And I think all the time about all of the opportunity that unfolded in front of me, being from a neighborhood like that. I mean, not a neighborhood that, that uh, you could necessarily guarantee the kind of opportunity uh, that I've had, but they were there. There were opportunities to, to, to get to better educational resources. There were opportunities to get to cultural and social opportunities that led me to all of the things that I've been able to do. And as I've become more involved in that neighborhood now, in the last few years, it is a very different place. It's a place where almost 60% of the adults are unemployed. It's a place where just on the block where I was born, there are 30 houses, 15 of them are abandoned and stripped. And so as I'm over there thinking about what can change the neighborhood, I'm really focused on the kids I see who are on that block, the kids I see walking up and down the block to school, the kids I see playing out in the street football and basketball because there are no more playgrounds, the kids I see just sort of around that area. And I think to myself all the time, what are the prospects for a kid born in that neighborhood 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to have the kind of life that I've had? What are the prospects for kids who are being born there now to have those kind of opportunities? And when you think about it, it is those first three to five years that we have to, to lay out in front of those folks uh, some opportunity to get to something better than what they have. And there are a lot of other problems in that neighborhood that have to do with adults. There are a lot of other problems in that neighborhood that have to do with government and disinvestment. But I become really focused on those faces, those little bitty faces I see <clears throat> running up and down that street and comparing them to me. They are me. They are the me of 2017. And so I think one of the things that we want to talk about today is how do, you, how do you increase the opportunities for those kids? How do you make it possible for a kid born in that neighborhood today to grow up to be uh, successful the way I was? So what we want to do is we have some panelists who we're going to hear from about early ed opportunities. I'm going to ask them some questions. And you have on your tables in front of you some cards that you can write questions down on We'll incorporate those questions into the conversation. You also have on the table uh, a handout that has some policy imperatives that uh, we want you to think about, things that we might do. I love that. Not just talk, do uh, about expanding early ed opportunities. And then there's some coloring books in the middle of the table. I got to admit, I don't know what the coloring books are about, but that sounds fun, doesn't it? <laughs> you can take those with you. Uh, all right, so joining us on stage uh, are Robert Barnett, who is the Dean of the School of Education and Human Services at the University of Michigan Flint. Good to see you. Understand. Uh, next is Emetra Nelson. She's a student at Michigan State University and a parent, Emetra. Next is Michael Nutter. He is the David N. Dinkins Professor of Professional Practice in Urban and Public Affairs at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. He's also the former mayor of the city of Philadelphia. Yeah. 
And last but not least is Sean Welsh, Regional President, uh, West Michigan of PNC Bank. Okay, uh, first, I just want to open it up to the panel to talk about where we are with this discussion about early ed. Uh, I hear lots of people discussing this topic a whole, a whole lot more than they used to, seem to be recognizing that it's a problem. How are we doing, though, in turning the ship uh, in a direction that, that makes some sense? Uh, that makes better sense for the things that we need. We'll start at that. I'd like end. to take a stab at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would characterize the landscape of early childhood education right now as a series of islands and deserts with vast oceans of need in between them. <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there is great work going on here and here and here and here around the state. But one thing that's not happening is we haven't built enough bridges to each of those islands so that all the work that we do is pooling our resources to make stronger across the state what we do in early childhood ed. <clears throat> the desert, in my opinion, is birth to three. Uh, that's the area where I think we need even more intervention than we do with our three and four year olds. Um, everybody knows that 90% of the brain is developed by the age of five, but by the age of 16 months, we can detect discrepancies in vocabulary and in behavior. And by the age of three, low-income students are speaking with a vocabulary of about 500 words, whereas their higher-income counterparts are speaking with vocabularies up to 11 and 1,200 words. So the need to intervene with birth through five, not just uh, three, four, and five, is, is essential. Uh, the, uh, as I looked at the 21st century report, the education report, uh, the section on early ed came up with, among others, four major recommendations that I think are critical to the work that we do. The first is to provide universal preschool for all four-year-olds in the state. We need to do that. It's a must. We need to build a stronger early education workforce with build our own pipelines in, in ways that are going to strengthen the quality of the education. We need to provide better access to the children and families to the services that we provide. And finally, we need to assess what we're doing so that those assessment data can go back into the programming and we can provide even more interventions for more sophisticated ways of providing high quality daycare and early childhood education. So Flint is, is involved and is as is, is committed to early childhood education as any city. Um, and we realize that it takes a village. It really takes a village. And so what I'll be talking about in bits and pieces throughout the session today um, will be the partnership citywide that we've created in Flint to provide opportunities for the lowest income students um, with the highest need. Uh, so Flint has planted its, um, uh, planted its flag in the ground. We planted our stake in the ground around an initiative that involves a partnership between the University of Michigan Flint, the Flint Community Schools, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, the Genesee Intermediate School District, the Community Foundation, the Kellogg Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, and a number of others. It's big. It takes a partnership. We've created, from a closed elementary school, a full birth to five high quality early childhood education center. So not only are we lifting these kids out of poverty, but we're offering all these wraparound services in healthcare and nutrition and transportation for the kids and their families because we believe that we have to lift whole families out of poverty if we're really gonna make an inroad. But our project doesn't stop there because we're funneling our kids as they age out of the, it's called the Cummings Early Childhood Center. As they age out of Cummings, we're funneling them in to the Flint Community Schools to provide higher quality students coming in the door. And we're working with teachers and professional development in K-3, so we're, we're raising all boats. We're increasing the, uh, the, uh, the quality of instruction, we're increasing the quality of students, and our work doesn't end when students leave the birth to five uh, session, the um, birth to five programs. And so that's how we're starting to change the landscape. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. I know sure. you are very eager to, <laughs> to jump in there. But I, I, I want to ask Imetra uh, to talk to him. I, I'm really glad she's 
on the panel. I mean, most of us up here are, are thinking about this from a policy perspective that's really important. Hers is a more personal take on this. Uh, this is somebody who is trying to navigate uh, the landscape with regard to, to early ed. So, so just tell us about how you have experienced that and whether you think it actually works for parents like you. Um, so I'm, am, I am a recent graduate from Michigan State University. Uh, I just graduated this past year. I think what works for me is um, just being able to, well, my school was very helpful in providing me with different tools that I needed in order to make sure my child was in a quality, accessible, and affordable daycare. So I think that what will make it easier is just being able to give people the access to have those different opportunities to have affordable and accessible daycare. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Michael Nutter, go ahead. Just, you know, I was listening to the dean and, you know, as I've now become a professor, um, you know, I pay much more attention to the dean. Um, <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, no, no, they're always right. Um, and, uh, and, and, but uh, I wanna first and foremost thank, uh, thank Lejeune and certainly the great folks at uh, W.K. Kellogg and Rip uh, at, uh, at Kresge, the work that you are doing and this convening uh, is critically important. And you know, I heard everything the Dean said and I certainly uh, agree, but I mean, just from perspective uh, and the kinds of things that we started and continue to do in Philadelphia, even though I'm uh, out of office now, uh, you are starting from a base of interest and activity uh, and engagement that is so far beyond where we were just a couple years ago, uh, starting out with this work. I mean, I've been paying attention. I had the opportunity, again, with the two foundations uh, to speak to the stewardship uh, group, uh, the leadership that they're providing. Uh, Sean, I was talking a second, what PNC has been doing for more than a decade. Um, I mean, you are starting uh, with an incredible foundation and uh, certainly should be very, very proud of you know, where this is moving, much more work to be done, I get that, uh, but you do have to start somewhere and you are off to a fantastic start uh, and really should be commended. Uh, this convening, um, you know, a little different uh, than uh, most conferences uh, that, that I go to. Um, <laughs> this is not a ballroom in, in uh, New York or Washington or Chicago. Um, you know, a bit of a journey to get here, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> the nighttime conversation. Um, the level of engagement by the business community, the philanthropic community, the nonprofit sector, elected officials and the like, that you're even having uh, this kind of discussion, that people are paying attention. I know we're in the middle of the budget season and you know, what was asked for maybe was not exactly deliberate, but more was put on the table than originally and all of that uh, is again, further, further uh, evidence uh, that people are really paying attention uh, to what uh, goes on here. And so, you know, top 10 in 10 years, the you know, grow great, hope starts here, all of these uh, programs and projects, services, uh, and a level of coordination, uh, you, uh, you are gonna start your kids off uh, in a great way. And lastly, to the business community, I know this is not the end to end, um, but I just wanna communicate to you that, uh, and I had this conversation with both uh, Rip and, and Lejeune, um, this is not about, you know, this would be a nice thing to do for kids. This is not a moral argument. This is actually an economic argument. It is in your own self-interest. For Detroit or Flint or the state of Michigan, the United States of America, I've said many times that you know, education should be considered part of the national defense of the United States of America. Uh, and so investing in our children really is an investment in ourselves, it's an investment in jobs, it's an investment uh, in the economy. Uh, and if every one of us thought about children and the investment that we want primarily elected officials, the business community and philanthropic community to make, if we thought about them as if they were our own, because they are, but if you think about what you want for your child or your grandchild or niece or nephew or some child in your life, then adults, the other adults, would be making vastly different decisions for other people's children. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sean, go ahead. Right. Uh, I'll 
add a little bit onto that because those were all great comments. I think the thing that has really struck with me is, uh, you know, to add on what Michael was saying, is the awareness that we've seen within our community. Now, we've been on a journey um, for over a decade in, in the state of Michigan, and, and I can remember over a decade ago, and uh, the names will be nameless, but I went to speak to a group of legislators about the importance of investing in early childhood. And, and uh, someone came up to me afterwards and said, well, aren't we pouring money into an issue that's really a family issue? We can't solve family issues. And um, I don't think we're ha that discussion has evolved to where we are today because we now realize that every child is born equal uh, the minute they enter our world. And it's up to us as a, as a business community and as a world to make sure all those children reach their potential. And if they don't, then it becomes an economic issue. I'm the banker, so I'm the numbers guy up here. Uh, when I look to see the little bit that we spend and invest in quality early childhood, what we do for that child to make them achieve their potential, but also what we do for the society to save money, uh, the discussion has evolved just immensely. And, and I think we're at that next point where we need to start talking about alignment. Uh, we need to start talking about delivering where the people want it delivered. And uh, I, I think we're at a good spot, but we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, Mayor Nutter, I want to start uh, this time with you. Uh, you fought this fight in, in Philadelphia and encountered some pushback uh, to, uh, on a number of different fronts, uh, even if not to the sort of core message and, I, and idea. Talk about what those arguments were about and whether you won and whether they're making a difference now. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Sean said reminded me of some of the stuff back home that, uh, you know, well, you know, the city puts in X amount of money into, you know, uh, K to 12 and the state does the same. But again, we're talking about birth to, to five and uh, Head Start and all these other programs. I heard uh, Mayor Duggan, I did not hear his speech uh, yesterday. I wasn't here yet, although I've heard uh, great reviews, but I heard him earlier today uh, talking about uh, sometimes some of the first things to be cut uh, our programs and services uh, to, uh, to kids. And so, you know, there's no requirement, uh, actually in Pennsylvania, the starting school age is eight, uh, which is absurd, of course, uh, but there's no requirement uh, to provide uh, pre-K. Uh, and, uh, you know, part of that uh, pushback was, you know, well, you know, we only have so much money and, you know, what are you gonna raise taxes or how are you gonna pay for this? And all, you know, all the usual uh, arguments. Uh, our response was to get parents and community uh, leaders uh, actively engaged in this issue. And we did, you know, to some extent make a, it is really about our children and all of those arguments, but uh, also very strongly pushed on uh, the economic side of it. And uh, one of the things that I did to demonstrate to elected officials and others that the city really, the citizens really wanted this was uh, to put a measure on our home rule charter ballot uh, that created a universal pre-K commission because I wanted the voters to have an opportunity to weigh in, in a way, on this issue to demonstrate uh, to the broader uh, community that we're very serious about this. And so um, one of our council members sponsored it. It passed over 80%. I'm not exactly sure why anyone would vote against that, but, you know, um, <laughs> people do what they do. Um, and so, but it laid out a mandate that not only we have a commission to study the issue, but also the city council uh, would be essentially required uh, to come up with a proposed uh, funding solution. And if they did not, uh, if they didn't pass one uh, in the first year, the process automatically started over again until at some point uh, they actually did what needed to be done. And so uh, when the citizens uh, step forward in that, uh, with that level of strength, uh, I think it sent a very powerful message uh, not only in Philadelphia, but uh, actually to Harrisburg, uh, that we're very serious about this issue uh, and we're actually going to try to do something about it. So, I mean, there was some initial pushback, um, but, I, you know, when you're up in the 80-plus percent range, uh, uh, folks kind of get the message. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dean Barnett, uh, talk about the sort of wraparound nature of your work. It's focused on kids, of course. Sure. But you, you guys are sort of realizing that you can't just focus on the child, you have, a, you have right. other issues. Right, so first of all, Cummings opened six months ago, so we're fully up and running now, and we're, we're realizing some of the, the initiatives that we put into place, but um, 
I think one of the most important is access through transportation because the kids who are coming to our facility, sadly, are coming as a result of a crisis. This is a free service for all of these kids birth to five. Uh, their parents don't always have access. So one of the, the key components is we partnered with the Mass Transportation Authority. Those buses go out into the neighborhoods in, in designated spots. They pick up the parent or the family member and the child and bring them to the school. So the, the parent is able to drop the child off properly. While they're there, we're giving them access to cases of water because they don't have vehicles to go to the distribution site. So we're, we're taking on two initiatives at the same time. Uh, and then at the end of the day, those parents are uh, bused back in to pick up their children and, and, and go home. We're also building a health clinic so that uh, the children in the center their siblings, whether they're in the center or not, and their immediate family members will have access to vaccinations, physicals, prescriptions, and again, it's an access issue that we've got to address, so everything that we're looking at is about access. For me, the most important aspect beyond what we're doing with the children is a two-generation education system where we have a parent education program on site. So while the children are getting high quality Day, uh, early childhood care, their parents are earning their high school diplomas, their GEDs, they're, they're strengthening the family core, which is going to strengthen the community, it's going to strengthen the economy. And these kids are going to come, and these families are going to come out stronger consumers, stronger students, better prepared for the workforce, and so we think that's critically important. Yeah. Uh, Imitra, uh, Imitra, uh, give us a, a sense of how much support you felt in in trying to, to deal with the system? Did you feel like uh, the system was set up to, to make it easier for you? Did you feel like there was support for other things perhaps that you needed from, uh, from it? Okay. Well, um, one of my top challenges were, was waiting for my paperwork to process. So um, when my daughter had to transition into a new daycare, um, I filled out paperwork and then I had to wait up to 45 days for her to process. This became a financial burden because I ended up having to pay, pay the daycare lady a portion of my rent money. So that process was definitely um, it definitely hurt me. Yeah. Um, fortunately, my mom was able to be there to you know, help me pick up the pieces, but since I'm an independent person, I was reliant on this childcare to help me um, to be independent, yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sean, talk about uh, the, uh, the investments here that sort of align with uh, the governor's uh, recommendations with regard to, to K-3. Yeah, and first of all, I'll commend the governor and the legislature for, for their investments in, in four-year-old preschool. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, if you look at the journey we've come to, and, and uh, they've, they told me beforehand that I was not supposed to lobby for any pending legislation, so I'm not. <laughs> but, 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 it'd be kind of cool if that got renewed again, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sorry, Lejeune. <laughs> the, um, but if you look- If he was lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can rule on that, but the, uh, but if you look at the alignment, and I, I'm gonna answer a different question, sorry, Stephen, but uh, to, to a Metro's <laughs> comment, um, we started a group uh, in the west side of the state. Uh, it's been in place for about five or six years now, and it's a group of CEOs. Uh, when we first started, it was a group of about 20 of us. Uh, we're now up to over 100. And uh, it's part of the journey of awareness, because exactly what Metro just said, you know, she's a, obviously a very talented young mother pursuing an education, wants the best for her child. We didn't know the, the, the obstacles that we were putting in front of our people. And to, in front of our future talent, our future managers, and our future leaders of our country. And uh, as we started our early childhood working group, uh, there were you know, two or three people like me who had no idea what was going on. And we just assumed the world was all great. And then we had some educators we brought in, and then we had, uh, we had some, some parents. They came in, and you know, the first meeting, uh, our jaws were on the table, saying, how in the world do you do anything? And, uh, and at, that, at that point, we said, okay, the one thing we can do is we can make a lot of noise. And, and that's where business needs to step in. Uh, that's where business needs to be. 
And they need to step in, they need to identify, understand the problem, and we've all heard examples of different people doing this. I commend John Ricalto for the day he traveled and went to school with kids. He got an education, and believe me, the legislators heard about it afterwards. He did the right thing. Um, so when we're asking the business people what can they do, learn about the issue, and then step in and advocate for the solutions, because we're asking our future, our talent, uh, to do things that are impossible. Uh, there's not enough time in the day, so I didn't answer your question. So, no, that's okay. Uh, sometimes, though, I hear from, from business people that, look, this is government's job, right? Uh, government is stepping away from its responsibilities, and it's not the private sector's obligation to fill that. Well, I think it's team sport, and, and I've sat through a number of panels over the last couple of days, and I've heard that term a lot, and I love it. Uh, it, it's a team sport, it's the foundation stepping in, it's the government stepping in, it's the business community stepping in. The data is there and we have to take the data and we have to look around the corner. Because if you look at the great companies in our world, if they're managing from quarter to quarter and changing the strategy, they're really not going to end up anywhere because they never set a goal. Um, so if we're setting up systems and processes to help kids that the day they're born, we want to be successful 18 years from now, we've got to look around the corner. And we've got to see what's coming at us. And uh, that requires team sport. That, that requires all of us. And, and the business people get that to, to an extent. Yeah. We're still on a journey. Right. Uh, but I think they're getting a lot more than they used to. But Stephen, so, I, think, I mean, that's, such, that's so short-sighted. Um, again, just from the dollars and cents perspective. Right. So, educate a child, um, birth to five, K to 12, all these different systems. And if you don't, it's not like the child is going to disappear. Right? They don't go off somewhere. We then spend more money on the back end than you would ever mm -hmm. have to spend on the front end. And who pays for that? The business people. Citizens. I mean, what are you talking about? I mean, it's, a, it's just an absurd, you know, kind of mindset, and it's so short-sighted. They would never run their companies that way. As Sean said, it is about future planning, and workforce is going to change rapidly over the next few years. And so that 10-year-old that you're not really paying a whole lot of attention to, now that they've gotten past five, um, and hopefully are in some school somewhere, in 10 years, that person is going to be knocking on your door, or you're going to be looking for the replacement of the worker who retired, which is why you interview 200 people to hire three. Because the other 197, you know, were not reading properly, didn't have the skills, et cetera, et cetera. All of these other challenges, which is a cost factor for uh, these businesses in the first place. It, it is not free. It, you know, you, it, it's, you know, we're in Michigan. It's the Fram oil filter. Yeah old commercial, the young people, you can, you can Google that. Um, you're either going to pay now or you're going to pay later. That's what this is. This is not rocket science, it's not science, it's just common sense, right? Invest on the front end, you're going to get the reward on the back. So one of the ways that we need to invest on the front end, and I'm really moved by the, the situation that you shared and by the teamwork comment that you made, Sean, um, in education, within the early childhood system, those of us who are up and running in, in creating high quality uh, uh, early childhood systems, we need to help each other. We need to work with other providers, licensed and unlicensed, to make sure that we're raising all boats in the quality of, of early childhood education that, that we bring. And I think there are three major elements to that that we need to adhere to. One is research. Uh, one is uh, teacher professional development. Um, and the third is assessment. I think we need to combine all of that work, which, which we're doing at Cummings. We have a full operational research center to collect data that can be put back into the programming. But, but the point is, we need to learn from that research and from those assessments and from that professional development that we offer to other providers so that we can um, share the wealth, so to speak. We've created what's called a mentor provider program. So the university researchers and university uh, undergrad and grad students are working with the Cummings facility um, to provide 
uh, the kind of research that we can share with others, but more importantly, we've created a provider mentor program. So we're creating professional development opportunities for all of the early childhood centers in the county in Genesee, uh, because we have to. We cannot just operate as individuals, but we have to operate as a whole community of educators. Yeah, uh, Dean, I want to give you a chance to talk about alignment. That's a, a term we hear a lot when we're talking about uh, early ed, why is that important? Uh, and are we, are we on a path here in Michigan to better alignment? Yeah. Of no, I think we absolutely have to do that. Lejeune mentioned it in the Hope Starts Here um, presentation about this, this need to connect early childhood to the K-3 system and the K-12 system. So one of the things that, that I think is really important to do is make sure that the early childhood doesn't, uh, the early childhood experience doesn't end when those kids age into the school district. It's, it's our job to make that transition for them by one of the things that we can do is create a continuum kindergarten classrooms so that these higher quality students coming into the district can get acclimated to that district. And as I said, at the same time, we're working with the teacher professional development. So that's the continuum, not just offering early childhood high quality um, education, but connecting it to the K-12 system. Because really, in addition to offering this opportunity for the children and the families, we're partnering very, very closely with the Flint Community Schools to rebuild that school system. And once we work through the K-3 alignment, then we move on to the middle school alignment and, the, and the, the high school alignment. So the idea is to rebuild the entire district from the ground up, starting from the front end. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and, I, and I, on that, I, I think each community is different. Uh, that was one of the things we found in the west side of the state for our early childhood working group. Uh, we were covering 13 counties, so we had urban neighborhoods in Grand Rapids uh, that would look like any other urban neighborhood you would see, and you had rural neighborhoods where the kids were spread all, all, all over the place. So there, was, there were food issues, there were transportation issues, there were language issues, there was um, cultural issues, and we started realizing that we had to break it down a little bit because you, we can't go in with this huge solution and say, okay, it's gonna fit everywhere, because it won't, because there, it's different in every one. And so we're in the process now, which is gonna be really messy, but it has to be done, of doing a, a resource map. Because we're not totally convinced, and I'm not convinced either way, that, that we don't necessarily have enough or too much funding for this. I'm not sure, it's just a matter, we don't have it aligned right. And the Kellogg's Foundation said they're gonna do this for us at Talent 2025, so. Yeah, and I've heard numbers that blow me away, that the, the amount of dollars available for early childhood, and you look at it and say, oh my gosh, why are we not being successful? A lot of issues are money issues, no doubt about it. But a lot of issues, to your comment, Bob, are alignment issues. We have to make it for that mother to be able to access that for the quality childcare, for the quality education. Um, they want it, we have to make it for the teacher to be able to deliver that great experience. The one thing that uh, I learned and a number of my you know, fellow people on this board learned is I've, I've never met a teacher that didn't want the absolute best for their student. Mm -hmm. I've never met a parent that doesn't want the absolute best for their child. All, all the goals are aligned. Everyone wants the, right, the same thing, mm -hmm. it's just, Everything else isn't aligned. We, we haven't made it easy to get to there. So, uh, Reminder that uh, these little note cards are on your table, and if you have a question that you want me to ask, uh, you can write them down and hand them to Dan or uh, the other people who are collecting, and we'll try to work them in up here. There's a good question here for uh, Emetra. What don't we understand about supporting young parents and children? What are the things about your life that you feel like the people who are making the decisions about early ed don't get? Um, what I would have to say to that is that it's easy to have access to affordable and accessible daycare or child care. Um, I think they're both the same in a sense where, where it's helping to prepare my daughter to have an easier transition into kindergarten. 
So I think the, the struggle to have access to quality daycare is hard. Me as a, as a, as a student trying to go through school um, and, and take classes and take my daughter to school, it was very hard. I, I had to manage, time manage, I had to plan out things. And so I think that politicians or people that are looking at us um, should know that it's not easy. And it's, it's definitely something that takes a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to the rest of the panel, uh, how, do we, how do we change the sort of understanding of that? The, the, there's a tension, I think, between the concept of people who live in poverty and the idea that quality, which sometimes costs money, uh, is the thing that they not only deserve, but need, I mean, for the system to work. How do we get people to, <coughs> to understand that and see it? Well, um, I mean, I think it would be helpful if people in high positions, whether you know, elected or appointed, and I think I just saw uh, Mayor Archer uh, come in the room. Um, I want to thank him certainly for his, for his service, but I mean, I, unless I read the story wrong, one of the most absurd statements uh, that I've heard about in recent times was the HUD secretary um, su suggesting somehow uh, that poverty uh, was a mindset. Right. We might have talked about this a little bit. In the conference. <laughs> yes, I mean, this is like the dumbest thing anyone can say. I mean, no one wants to be poor. No one. Poor people don't want to be poor. They don't like it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not something you aspire to. So, I mean, so from that absurdity to just, you know, hey, you know, our family made it, you know, we walked six miles of school uphill both ways and all this stuff and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, daddy worked in the, the manufacturer of the mine and put six kids and they all have PhDs and if we could do it, you could do it. You know, first of all, life has changed. Everyone has different circumstances uh, and um, everyone has talked about this alignment issue. I mean, these are decisions about systems that are often made by folks who have never had to go through the experience, will never have to apply mostly for anything, uh, rules and regulations that are completely misaligned, written by folks, again, who will never have to access uh, many of these systems and think that they're you know, doing something uh, to prevent, you know, of course, waste, waste, fraud, and abuse, and because you know, um, only poor people steal somehow in their minds. Um, yeah. So, I mean, again, all of these absurdities uh, in, uh, in the public uh, sphere and dialogue uh, that take place out there. And so um, I think rather than uh, folks just kind of spouting off, you know, um, elected officials, high appointed officials, you know, should literally try to go through some of these systems. Um, you know, try to, you know, take somebody down to the local office. All right, you fill out this application and wait 45 days and see how that goes right. in your life. <laughs> Um, there's this, um, just uh, kind of a quick example. I mean, it's, it's from a movie, but it's real. Uh, there's a movie called, um, I think, Imperial Dreams. And so this young guy, he's just gotten out of, uh, just, uh, he's a returning citizen. And he's got a son whose mother is now incarcerated. And his probation officer tells him, of course, you need to get a job. Fine, I got that. He goes to get his driver's license. The driver's license, the DMV person says, well, you have $15,000 in uh, overdue child support payments. He said, well, but I don't have a job. The screen says, you owe this money, therefore I cannot give you your driver's license. He says, well, how could I possibly owe child support? I was incarcerated. He said, well, the state automatically applies for the mother, who was also now incarcerated. And so the guy is standing there and he says, let me understand this. You can't give me my driver's license, which I need to get a job. I can't pay the $15,000 because I don't have a job, because you can't give me my driver's license to get a job. 
So, yeah, basically, but that's the system. That, I mean, who would design something so absurd to prevent someone from actually trying to do the right thing? I need a driver's license to get a job, I'll pay my child support, and take care of my kid. Why wouldn't we set up a system that allowed a person to pursue getting back right by society? Paid your debt, now you're trying to take care of your kid and, and the mother and, and, and all of that. And so, I mean, I think that uh, folks need to look at, as has been said earlier, look at these systems. How are they designed? What are we trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Right? What are we trying to accomplish? Do we want people to get on the right path? Or do we, do we just want to fill in the boxes, check the, check the, did you follow all the rules? Yes. With a lot of absurd outcomes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Sean, I want to ask you about uh, th that mindset. Uh, that designs these systems that don't make any sense. Uh, you work in a bank, right? Uh, one of the things- You're not gonna badmouth banks. I'm not gonna <laughs> badmouth banks. We need banks. Uh, we need more banks investing in Detroit. But, um, uh, you know, you guys look all the time at uh, investment versus return when you're making decisions. Yeah. This is a pretty easy one, it seems, that if you make the investment upfront, uh, not only is there a, re a return on the back end, but it, you're saving expense on the back end as well. How come, how come that's so hard? Well, you, you, hit it, you just hit it right on the head there, Stephen. And as I was thinking and preparing for this, I thought about that exact example. Um, when people come into a bank to, uh, if they're a business owner and they want to borrow money to buy a machine, the banker is going to ask them one question probably, or maybe a couple questions, but the one question they're going to ask them is the cost benefit. If, if I lend you $10,000, what's it gonna make you, to your point? And so we're asking our society to not invest, potentially, hopefully that's not the answer we come to, to not invest in these kids for, you know, I don't know the exact numbers now, Bob can probably clean me up on this, but it's five, $6,000 for quality, four or five year old preschool education if they don't, if they're not prepared to get to that third grade reading assessment and pass well, and this is a terrible statement, but it's fact, a number of these kids are gonna stray off the path. Um, what does it cost us to incarcerate somebody a year? 40,000 plus a year? 34. So there's your cost benefit. I mean, there's your numbers. Right. I mean, if you look and say for, for four years, for five years, would we, does it make sense to us to invest $5,000 a year in a child, and then, so we have $25,000 into this equation, to later on eradicate or reduce drastically a $40,000 cost? Absolutely we would do that. And that's just one of the, the costs. Sure. Not to mention, it's just the right thing to do. As I keep coming back to, um, when I'm talking to different groups about early childhood, every child is born equal. I don't care who the parents are, every child is born equal when they arrive on the earth. It's then us, our responsibility to give them the resources to achieve their potential. And if we do that, it's the greatest return that we can probably make on any investment we make. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dean. The, in, the investment's a little more than that. You're right, that is far less than incarcerating our, our, our citizens. Uh, the, the cost of per pupil averages, if you look across centers, it's about $15,000. Um, to educate a preschool, but it's an investment and it's a great investment, but we have to do, I mean, everybody mentioned mindsets and different kind of mindsets. The person who said that poverty is a mindset, that mindset needs to change first <laughs> and foremost. Well, we but should we, just change them out of their job, but that's a whole different Sure, thing. <laughs> but, but we need to change, <laughs> we need to change mindsets within the community that we're working in the early childhood era. We need to change our mindsets in, in business, in, in the political arena, in the education arena. In education, we need to stop the stereotypical, here's this fix that we can bring to you. That's not going to work for a metro or, or families like a metro. We need to meet families where they are, mm -hmm. children where they are, and build programs that are gonna support them. That's really what's gonna help change a mindset, but we really need to help change the mindset of our citizens and residents as well. A state um, <coughs> poll showed how um, education was ranked in the state. They, the, the poll overwhelmingly saw uh, K through three as the, the most important 
high school graduation as a second, and early childhood as third. This is, again, working from the back end and not the front end. So we have a lot of mindsets to change as we do this work, but the best way to do it is show what kind of work we're doing, that it's impactful, and that it changes lives. Yeah, uh, there's a question from the audience about uh, a number of academics who have recently sort of challenged the value of early ed, saying that the gains don't last. Uh, that we can't prove that the games last. How do you? Well, there's a great that? study going on at the University of Cincinnati right. where they're <clears throat> tracking birth through college, high school graduation. And so they're actually looking at what the impacts um, are. But we already know that if we can start these kids down a path between um, zero and five, we're going to create a better quality student who can work through the school system, who can graduate with skills that employers want. So it's an economic issue as much as it's an education issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and I'm not familiar with the, some of those studies that you're referencing, but I do know in Grand Rapids in the public school system that we've privately funded a program now for summer reading loss, um, which is, you know, if we're looking at these children, they're, we're, we've got them in a quality four-year-old preschool, so we've done that. Yeah, so we're helping there. We're trying to make it so that they get into kindergarten and first grade and second grade and they're succeeding and they're moving forward. But the reality is that they're, they're coming from homes that probably don't have the books, they don't have the educational background to help these kids. So we do need to invest to change this. Yeah. Yeah, the, it, is, it is a resource issue. It may be an alignment of where the resources are being spent, but we need to invest to change this. Um, is the investment not lasting? Um, I don't know the facts of the research, but maybe, you know, I don't know about all of you, but you know, when I left school when I was a kid and when the school got out in the summer, I did nothing academic all summer. So that's, but I was fortunate and, that and, I- And look at you today. Yeah, exactly, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just met him. <laughs> um, but I had parents who read to me and I had books and, yeah. and uh, so that supplemented it. So. Uh, Mayor Nutter, if you, uh, if you could look at what happened in Philly and sort of drop a three-point plan for, for Michigan to follow uh, to, to, to get to the place that, that you got that city, what, what would it look like? Well, a couple of things. One, I uh, tend not to give uh, advice to elected officials in public, so, <laughs> um, but I mean, it was, for us, it was about constant communication having goals, reporting on those goals, whether we exactly achieve them or not. So, you know, my first day in office uh, at the inauguration, um, uh, in Philadelphia at least, the mayor is not directly in charge of public education. The state took over, thought they could do it better. <laughs> right. Um, and, it didn't work uh, out there either. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. Um, but we uh, have an oversight board, five members, three appointed by the governor, two by the mayor. Um, but clearly the mayor is not directly in charge. I said that we were gonna cut in half the high school dropout rate and almost double the college degree attainment rate. Now I'm not in charge of public schools and clearly not in charge of post-secondary education, but I wanted something to be measured by. And I wanted to use those goals to drive an agenda that every day, the six to 10 to 12 speeches a day I made, every speech, to every group, no matter what we were there for, I weaved in the importance of education and our goals. There came a point in time in, in my tenure where folks could repeat back to me what those goals were. And I thought at that point we'd actually kind of broken through. You know, repetition penetrates the dullest of minds. <laughs> when I came in office, we had 53% of our high school students graduating. When I left, the number was 65. 18% uh, college degree attainment rate, people over 25. When I left, it was about 26. Did we reach the goals that I wanted? No. Did we move the agenda forward and make progress? Absolutely. There are tons of young people today who did graduate from high school, who did go on to college, who are being productive because we invested in them, we communicated constantly to the public, and everywhere we went, we talked about the importance of these issues. And so it really was about communication, it is about accountability, it's about um, uh, driving an agenda and getting people focused on what is really important. Uh, and that was some of the key. Uh, but again, you start with a tremendous foundation here. Uh, and uh, when I spoke with the stewardship group, 
uh, and Lejeune remembers this. Um, there was a, one of the uh, members uh, was there with her child. Uh, it was in a stroller, so I'm assuming somewhere in the one-two uh, neighborhood. Or maybe it was a, the bigger thing. Um, Akiva. Uh, and uh, she had to leave early. And I said uh, that every meeting you have should start with someone asking the question, how is Akiva doing today? Every meeting. Because you're going to follow her journey and follow her path. And every one of us here in this room has some young person in our lives. Maybe part of your family, maybe the kid down the street. Every day, ask, how is so-and-so doing? How is Akiva doing today? Mm -hmm. And watch them grow up. That's about focus. It's about being on a mission. Because that was us one day. And someone cared enough about us that we're now here in this room to try to help somebody else. Mm -hmm. I'll just say this. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead. The uh, filing deadline for the Michigan gubernatorial race in 28. <laughs> <laughs> I got some. Extra, I got some extra room in my house if you want to move. <laughs> You still got a year. Thank you. <laughs> and I just met him. He already offered me a room. Uh, uh, Dean Barnett, talk about the, the things. Same question. If we were to put a list together of things we might do here in Michigan that would really make a big difference in the short term, uh, what would that look like? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I, what I would say, the, the number one outside of what we've talked about so far, the one, number one priority needs to be, we've got to build our own pipeline of early childhood educators. We've got to build a strong pipeline so that we're investing not in just in these kids, but those who teach them. And for me, working in an inner city, it's devastating to see how few minority students become teachers, and more significantly, how few minority men become teachers, right? So we're launching a program, we're recruiting right now. So next fall, we're gonna cohort 20 inner city students who are they're, they're, they're in their 12th grade, and they're going to be taking uh, early childhood courses at the Mott Community Colleges who we're partnered with, and they're going to be doing 120 hours of observation on site at the Cummings Early Childhood Center. So the idea is when they graduate, they will have what's called a CDA, which is the minimum uh, requirement to teach in early childhood. So we're already starting down that path of building our own. But there's a bonus here because the University of Michigan runs the Cummings Center. And if we hire those students at Cummings, then they're eligible for our free tuition program. We've partnered with Mott Community College and are paying for them to finish their associate's degree. So there's access to education. Once they finish their associate's degree, then we're incentivizing them through scholarships to continue on and finish the bachelor's degree. We need more bachelor's degree credentialed teachers who are minority and minority male, and that's what we need to do to, to put them back in and place them into the inner city classrooms. We're partnering with the Flint Community Schools to do just that. We're identifying schools and sites where we can place those students back into the classroom. That's I great. think that's a pretty high priority. Yeah, that's good. Great idea. You met, uh, if there was one thing you could change tomorrow about all this, what would it look like? Well, I, one thing that I would change would definitely be the application process. <laughs> I definitely think that it needs to be a little bit more streamlined so that um, the process doesn't take as long. Because when I went through that situation where I had to wait up for 45 days, I was already in the system for a snap. So I'm like, well, why is this taking so long? Shouldn't it be quicker or something since I'm already in the system? So I think that if, there, if the process is a little bit more streamlined, that would help us a lot better. Yeah. Uh, is there a need for somebody inside the system to communicate better with people like you about what's even available in, in the system? How did you even <coughs> figure out what, what you could do uh, for your child? 
Well, my mom, she definitely played a big part in helping me to figure out what I need to do when I first had my kid because I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm having a baby. I don't know what to do. And uh, she kind of walked me through the steps. So I think that without her, this definitely would have been, wouldn't have been possible for me to even have access to that. And I know a lot of people today, they don't have families to help them out with different things. They don't have moms or you know grandparents to help walk them through this process. So I think that communication would definitely be important in helping to uh, make this process a little bit better accessible for people of a lower economic status. I sure wish, Ametra, that, um, that your community had what we're building right now because it speaks directly to your point. We're going out in the community with the help of our funders and we've set up what's called pop-up school. So we take a van full of materials for the kids, for the education materials, and full of information for the families. And we're educating families at community centers in the neighborhood. We go out into the communities and, and educate families on what the, the process is. We try to streamline the process for them. We recruit the, their, their students through this process. And so instead of waiting for the community to come to us, we're going to the community because that's where it needs to happen. Uh, Sean, what, what would be on your checklist? Yeah, uh, I think you asked for three. I'll give you two. Um, one is consistency. Uh, if you go back, there was a report out a number of years ago by the Education Trust, and they studied the states in the United States of top to bottom, who was top, who was bottom. Sadly, Michigan was near the bottom at that point. But they looked to see the two top ones, and it was Tennessee and Massachusetts, if I remember. And they said, how did they get there? Because when they started, they were at near the bottom. And you remember this, Mike. And, and the answer was they did the same thing consistently. They invested in the same programs. They delivered the same outcomes for those families. So after a 10, 20 year period, I think it was, the two top states, I think still, are Massachusetts and Tennessee. And I will tell you the reason is, is and they had multiple, they had differing parties controlling their governor's mansion yeah. and their state legislature. Mm -hmm because they made education a nonpartisan issue, which it is, by the way. Right. So right. that would be one. And the other thing is what Demetra said. We, we need to make, we need to take our resources, which, you know, whether there's enough or not enough, we'll find out as we dig deeper into this, but it's not easy. You know, it's, uh, it, we just do not make it easy for people to go out and take advantage of resources that are there to make them successful. If we could do those two things, uh, we could make a, I think, make a huge impact on the system. Okay. Uh, let's give our and I wasn't lobbying. A hand. Yeah. <laughs> You're not lobbying. We want to be sure and uh, thank our sponsors here at WK Kellogg Foundation and the Kresge Foundation uh, for putting all this on. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks David. David.